Yeah. Oh, Jason, there we go. Jason. There you go. I'm oh, I'm going to I'm not going to use your slides, Jason. <laughs> Great. Um, so, uh, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I've really learned a lot so far, and I expect to learn a lot more. Um, my comment about L looking at LC issues in citizen science is that um, I think that it w it's a mistake if we don't attend to neglected LC issues in science generally. Because citizen science, to the extent that apparently it's a method, uh, takes place within the larger enterprise of what we call science. And we don't spend enough time, I, don't, I would argue, addressing critically the nature of science we have. So I'm coming from the perspective of someone who works on occupational and environmental health. And what I have observed is that most science is produced for government agencies or for profit corporations or industry trade associations or other nonprofits. And therefore, it tends to address the needs of those constituencies. And uh, it's not something that's objective and value free and without any, and, and of equal value to all people in the world. That it has a, a, a very intended development. So the kind of, I think I'm here because I've been involved in study, in research instigated by workers and community members who are exposed to things that they think are harming them and nobody's done research on it. And so I'm going to give you just one example of this type of issue, which has to do, and I may use this acronym, so I put this here to remind myself, concentrated animal feeding operations. Most meat that people consume now are produced in factories, not at Old McDonald's farm. Uh, this is, I'm going to describe what pork production is like in North Carolina, where I'm from. Uh, there, the pigs live in these confinements on slats. Their waste is flushed out of the confinement buildings into these giant open fecal waste pits. And then the waste is sprayed out on nearby fields. This is fecal waste that's being aerosolized. And each of these sprayers, unlike a garden or lawn sprayer, has a radius of maybe three or 400 feet. Um, the confinement buildings have to be ventilated to keep the animals uh, healthy. These giant fans are blowing the particles and gases, uh, including many toxic particles and gases, into the neighborhood. And people live in many places very close by. We recently used data from the 2010 census and found that there are almost a million people in, just in North Carolina living within three miles of an industrial swine operation that was re-permitted in 2014. And the operations are permitted to use these techniques for waste management. Uh, people report that it very, it devastates their way of life in rural areas. They can't garden, hang out their clothes, they have to wear a mask to go outside. Uh, the lower right was taken by a woman we met uh, this is fecal waste being sprayed in, across the street from her front yard. Um, so basically, it's, it's a horrible experience for these people. Um, when they contacted me, I've, I learned there was a lot of research going on about industrial swine production into uh, animal genetics, into feed, uh, into waste management, and it was being done by people at public universities, but nobody was studying the impacts on human health, uh, in particular the neighbors. There was some research on the workers. Um, I show this map. Uh, the only place that has the darkest red in the entire country is eastern North Carolina. 
This is the high area of the highest density of swine production in the nation. And so I got involved because people said, we need research documenting what's going on, because all these places are permitted. Um, and they're not just anywhere. You know what? They're none of these by country clubs or golf courses or by university president's offices. These are in communities of color. This is the relationship uh, in t with the operations re-permitted in 2014. Um, you can see a clear trend, more people of color, and this includes separately we analyzed for African Americans, for uh, Latino Americans, for Native Americans. Um, they're all disproportionately burdened. So um, some years ago, we started a, um, a study to document symptoms. We worked through community-based organizations. The IRB approved, uh, we trained, or they, the university trained, and the IRB approved the members of the community-based organization to help us um, recruit people, uh, conduct interviews to document their symptoms. When the study was released that afternoon, it was released by the State Health Department, uh, I received a letter from uh, an international law firm representing uh, the North Carolina Port Council. And I won't read this whole thing due to time, but basically they, under the state public records statute, I learned I am a public official. I just thought I was a university researcher. And I actually thought the data were mine, but I'm a public official. They belong to my employer. Um, uh, they, uh, the, the Port Council said, we want all the records, maps of where the people lived, their names, their identities, all my email. And the university council told me I had to turn all that over to the industry lawyers. And I realized I would never be able to do any more research in this community or try and assist these people who I had agreed to work with. Furthermore, the industry controls in many counties, the county commission, the ag department, the health department, they're very centrally, they play very important roles in all the important local institutions. And people are very fearful of retribution, losing their jobs, losing their benefits. And they could be very much harmed. And I was told that if I didn't turn over the records that I would be uh, arrested for theft of state property. So I had to get my own lawyer. The, uh, by the way, the, for those of you IRB members here, the IRB was scandalized by this because, of course, our protocol was approved by the IRB. But that didn't matter to the council's office. And I found out that the poor council had someone on the University Board of Governors, and their lawyer was friends with my institution's lawyer and so on. So it was very much uh, a, a difficult situation, let's put it that way. Um, but it was a, a wake-up call. And after this, we obtained certificates of confidentiality for our research. And on the topic of, um, of data collection, I want to emphasize that in the next work we did, which involved actually measuring the pollutants in people's communities where they were involved in helping to locate the air pollution monitors and collect information on their lung function and um, other responses. Uh, we tied that research to environmental justice organizing through community-based organizations. And so I feel one of the key things that we can do is recognize that one of the benefits of research for participants is not just that there's a scientific study that the academic gets a publication or something, but that the people who are actually affected by uh, something like pollution, are, that their organizations are strengthened, they can organize, they can petition their authorities for redress of grievances, and that they can use the research results in that process over time and that that's a way that the research process can actually 
be of benefit to people before there are any results, even if there were never a publication, that it can still benefit the people who are most, uh, have the most skin in the game in this case. So I'll stop there.